Genocide, and particularly the Holocaust. Uh, and of course, totalitarianism uh, and the repression of uh, human individuality and freedom that that involved. Today we're going to be looking at that from the angle of the collective traumatic memory that the Holocaust and other mass murders have left in Western and other societies. And to talk about that, a very distinguished sociologist has come out to public, Dr. Jeffrey Alexander, who is the Lillian Jameson Satan Professor of Sociology at Yale University. I think you've heard of Yale. He's also the co-director of the Center for Cultural Sociology. And indeed, he is the founder of the field of cultural sociology. Uh, a avenue of approach uh, in the discipline that sees culture as a powerful and autonomous force that has to be understood in its own right. And so in the talk today, we hear uh, Professor Alexander's talk today about trauma. Uh, that is really a talk about cultural impact, the cultural impact of horrendous events and how they mark the collective mentalities of all the people in a culture. Uh, Dr. Alexander is the author of many books. Uh, some of the most recent have been, uh, maybe this is kind of like resonates with the subject today, The Dark Side of Modernity, which appeared in 2013, Obama Power, which appeared in 2014, and The Crisis of journalism reconsidered, which hasn't appeared yet, but it's well on the way. So, uh, you've heard enough from me. Let me turn the floor over to our very distinguished visitor and guest lecturer, Dr. Jeffrey Alexander. of a collectivity feel they have been subjected to a horrendous event 
that leaves indelible marks upon the collective consciousness, making their marking their memories forever and changing their future identity in fundamental and irrevocable ways. As I've developed this sociological approach with colleagues and students, cultural trauma is, first of all, a theoretical concept. It's just empirical causal relationships among events, structures, perceptions, and actions. But the scientific concept is, it also newly illuminates a, a significant domain of moral responsibility and critical action. Because by constructing cultural traumas, social groups, national societies, and sometimes even entire civilizations not only cognitively identify the existence and source of suffering, but they also take on board more <coughs> responsibility for it. Insofar as groups identify with the cause of trauma, in a manner that implies their own moral responsibility. <laughs> then members of that co collectivity can define their solidarity relationships in ways that allow them, perhaps even compel them, to share the suffering of others for whose suffering they now take responsibility. Is the suffering of other people our own suffering? thinking that it might be, societies can expand the circle of the we. And when the circle of the we expands, extraordinary repairs in the institutional and legal networks of society can be made. And I would argue in fact only by experiencing the suffering of other people can the circle of the we expand. Some of the most important social developments in the post-war world, I'll argue later in this paper, have been produced by this kind of trauma process. Because social actors have newly identified themselves as the causal agents of other suffering, social solidarity has expanded. Moral universalism and social criticism have broadened, and fundamental institutional and legal changes have been made. The most extraordinary of all these developments has been the gradual halting, still incomplete and contested, but eventually intensely powerful identification of Christian peoples in the West with the millions of Jewish persons murdered by the Nazis during the Second World War. For millennia, Christian civilization had polluted Jews as nefarious and subhuman, excluding them from civil society, punishing them economically persecuting them culturally and politically, and sometimes killing them. When the Enlightenment unlocked the gates of European ghettos in the early 19th century, this oozing anti-Semitic wound that infected the Germany seemed to be on the mend. But the backlash against Jewish incorporation was fierce. There were pogroms in the East. There was a Dreyfus scandal in Republican France in the 1890s, there were new quotas on Jews in the United States, and rising anti-Jewish feeling in politics in Central Europe. The Nazi monster arose out of this backlash. While the Nazis' anti-Semitic strategy was more ambitious and extreme than it ever before been contemplated, their anti-Semitic feeling was not new. It wasn't new. In anti, its anti-democratic totalitarian state allowed Nazis to put into effect a permanent solution to the Jewish question, which was a phrase used widely throughout Europe and the United States. And it was only the military defeat of that state that prevented every last Jew from being murdered in Europe. Yet, while the Nazi state was demolished, broad anti-Semitic feelings remained, and not in post-war Germany alone. In subsequent decades, however, the widespread Jewish hatred, or Jew hatred, that had legitimated the Nazis' mass murder, 
allowing the blind eye to return to it throughout Europe and in much of the United States was attenuated, it was weakened. The pervasive network of anti-Semitic legal and institutional restrictions that had existed throughout the West, including the United States, were as a result eventually attacked and destroyed publicly. So they don't exist today. At the source of this world historical reversal, I will argue, was trauma work. Christian peoples who had nothing to do directly with the Holocaust, Americans, British, French, Scandinavian, and Austrians among them, came eventually to feel indirectly responsible for it. In doing so, they distanced themselves from anti-Semitic feelings and practices in which they had themselves been deeply implicated. One vital threat of trauma process transformed the image of the victim. So the first part is of, of trauma work is to transform the image of the victim. Rather than seeing the Nazis, <coughs> Jewish victims, as a depersonalized mass, and a mess, which is the way that Western people saw the Jewish victims uh, when the death camps were revealed. Popular culture in the 1950s, and particularly uh, the late 50s and 60s, began to personalize and differentiate Jewish victims, portraying Jews as recognizably human beings allowed non-Jews for the first time to experience deep emotional identification with the six million Jews who had been murdered. Emotional identification, as I said earlier, is one key aspect of extending to the circle of the uh, and broadening solidarity. You can't experience the suffering of others unless you see them as A powerful channel for this new form of cultural expression was the memoir. In the 1950s, there unfolded a series of dramatizations of the suffering and courage of the Dutch every girl, and Frank, whose diary eventually became required to be in millions of American elementary schools. In the decade after, Ellie Wiesel's Night also achieved massive popularity deeply penetrating the consciousness and conscience of Christian and secular citizens throughout the West. Another popular culture genre driving this, this dimension of trauma work was televised novels. In 1978, 100 million Americans viewed the Holocaust miniseries, and so did record-breaking audiences in Germany. It was in the wake of this mini-series, in fact, that the German Reichstag, the parliament, removed the statute of limitations on Nazi agents, allowing them, in other words, to be persecuted indefinitely, to be criminalized and put in jail. And their actions were now described as crimes against humanity, which is interesting because they were crimes against Jews. And that generalization of crimes against mass murder of Jews to a crime against humanity tells us a lot about the transformation of the Holocaust and the trauma process. Such dramaturgical personalization of Jewish victims <coughs> began tra to transform the Holocaust from an historical event into a, de a deeply moving trauma drama. What I call a trauma drama. One that increasingly engaged non Jewish audiences in pathetic experiences of tragedy and catharsis. This cultural transformation was pushed further by a new understanding of Holocaust perpetrators. Personalization had so altered the identity of the trauma's victim as to allow them to become a dramatic protagonist, like Anne Frank or the people. Various movies and 
Now, the other central figure in the Holocaust narrative, the Nazi antagonist, was also subtly changed. Perpetrator was removed from its historically specific particularity, and its status was transformed into a more archetypically evil role that eventually became a stand-in for all mankind, or humankind. The critical event initiating this reconstruction of perpetrator was the 1961 trial of Adolf Eichmann in Jerusalem. As orchestrated by then Israeli Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion, Eichmann's capture and trial was intended to reconnect the new nation's citizens to the persons and places of the original crime, to Germany, the Nazis, and the victimized Jews, in Ben-Gurion's words, to quote, the dimensions of the tragedy which our people experienced. Perfectly reasonable, but it didn't turn out to actually be that. By its conclusion, the IP trial had actually initiated something very different, which was a massive univer universalization of Nazi evil. Um, to a crime much larger than the Jewish people. The removal of the Holocaust from the particulars of time, place, and person was crystallized by Hannerman's infamous insistence on the banality of evil. By that she meant evil isn't something that only exceptional people do. It's a bureaucrat just following orders. All bureaucrats are just following orders, right? As the worst possible kind of evil. But that's where the phrase started. The banality of evil. Why is that so interesting? Because, um, well, this framing of Nazi, of Nazi evil as a banal evil became very influential, even as it was disputed, and it is still disputed today. Because as a banally evil person, Eichmann could be everywhere. Eichmann was the architect, the kind of technical architect of the Holocaust. He was discovered in Argentina, taken back by Israeli secret agents, and put on trial. Um, but the, the, the fact that the trial was to make him seem like just an average person who orchestrated one of the worst crimes in history. In this way, I would argue that the antagonists in the Holocaust trauma drama began to seem not so much larger than life monsters as normal human beings who were not so different from anybody else. Perhaps it was simply, as Nietzsche put it, human, all too human. There were other cultural developments that widened the circle of perpetrators. Most spectacularly, there was Yale psychologist Stanley Milgram's experiment demonstrated that ordinary, well-educated adult men could just follow orders from imperious authorities, even to the point of gravely endangering the lives of innocent people whose fates they had imagined were under their control. What happened is Milgram put ads in the paper, in the student newspaper at Yale, and invited uh, students to come in and participate in an experiment. They, there was a glass wall, and, uh, somebody came in and they struck black foots on them. The students were behind the glass and were ordered to increase the electricity on these people for the purposes of scientific experiment. And they often did so to the point where they were going to kill them. They were told that this was necessary for science. They were ordered to buy a person in a white coat who said they were a doctor. This, um, so that was the famous Milgram experiment. And the, it's, uh, the Milgram experiment made, became famous. It was on the cover of Time magazine because of this. It raised profoundly troubling questions because it generalized the capacity for radical moving it from Nazi deviance to everyday Americanism, and perhaps to 
and as such. As the Holocaust trauma drama broadened the cultural identification of and with perpetrator and victim, the US government began losing control over the telling of the Holocaust story, which is itself a very significant thing about who kind of controls the, 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 the telling of the story. When the Allied forces had defeated the Nazi, uh, the Nazi Germany in 45, they took control of the representation of the process, assuring that the Jewish mass murder would now be presented in an anti-Nazi way. Under the Nazi regime, there was no access uh, to, the, to what was going on. There was some knowledge that was out, but they told the story in their own because they control the means of narration. In the Allies' telling in America, but also Britain and France, they presented themselves as the moral protagonists, as pure-hearted and heroic carriers of the good. Two decades later, however, <coughs> in the 1960s, Western democracies were compelled to concede this dominant narrative position. The U.S. experienced a sharp decline in its political, military, and moral prestige. And domestic and international opposition to the U.S. war in Vietnam transformed the nation into a symbol for many, especially for intellectuals and educated people, into a symbol not of good, but of uh, anti-democratic evil and militarism. The US government now became identified in some influential quarters with terms that had been reserved exclusively for the Holocaust's Nazi perpetrators. According to the post-war Victor narrative, only the, not, only the Allies' World War II enemies could be represented as evil, as capable of doing the mass murder. But when America became America, spelled with a K, napalm bombs were analogized with gas pellets, the ones dropped in the death chambers at Auschwitz, and flaming Vietnamese jungles with the killing chambers. The American army had been hailed as a liberator of death camps. But for many Western intellectuals and a wide swath of the educated Western public, the US Army was now framed as perpetrating genocide in Vietnam against helpless people from Vietnam. Eventually, this broadening of the figure of perpetrator expanded to include other allies in the Second World War and those who had remained avowedly neutral as well. For example, in France, uh, well, France and even Austria had portrayed themselves as innocent victims of the Nazis. But as these transformations that I'm describing unfolded from the 60s onward, it gradually became <coughs> evident that France and Austria and Switzerland and Sweden had actually collaborated with the Nazis and made the Holocaust possible. And so the heroic myth of the resistor in France was, while there were a lot of heroic resistors, was also challenged. Um, and they, in other words, the identity of the perpetrator was brought uh, to include really all of the elements. And it was also pointed out that the US government knew about the death camps and refused to bomb them in 1943 and 1944. That they could have stopped the Holocaust, but they didn't. Why? Well, what they said is that Americans were so anti-Semitic that if the US government was seen as uh, helping the Jews in this way and diverting important war efforts, that it would undermine 
support for the war inside the United States. So this is all part of this kind of generalizing of the identity of the perpetrator beyond a particular time and place, the Germans, to include a lot of other possibilities. These kinds of processes of political deconstruction and symbolic inversion universalize the Holocaust. They allow the so-called lessons of the Holocaust, often referred to as post-Holocaust morality, to be applied in much less nationally specific and, I would argue, less particularistic ways. Holocaust came to stand for the systematic deployment of mass violence against members of any state of Christ, whether defined in an ethnic or an ideological way, anywhere and any time. As a symbol of radical evil, Holocaust became engorged and overflowing. It now dramatized as a signal tragedy of modern times, this engorged evil a drama that can help eternal return in Nietzsche's sense of tragedy. As with the Greeks and their tragedies, the immersion of Western citizens in the Holocaust drama provided catharsis, moral clarification, and perhaps even grace. The Holocaust legend was told and retold, dramatized, filmed, novelized in hundreds and eventually thousands of aesthetically compelling ways in response not only to emotional need, but moral ambition. Its characters, its plot, and its pitiable denouement allow a heightened sensitivity to modern social people. The trauma drama's message reflected a modernized, more reflexive, but still essentially similar version of tragedy as the Greeks. Evil is inside of all of us and in every society. If we ourselves have the capacity to be victims and also to be perpetrators, then none of us can legitimately distance ourselves from the suffering of victims or the responsibility of perpetrators. This cathartic experience and its moral lessons can allow us to change, however, so that we can prevent genocide from happening. Yeah. Okay, now we come to the next phase of this argument, which is that the ability, I've described the generalization of the Holocaust. The ability to script, cast, and produce a trauma trauma about mass murder spread then to other nations, to other marginalized and oppressed groups, and even to such contemporary enemies of the Jewish Israeli people as the Palestinians. Holocaust became what I call a bridging metaphor deployed by the powerless who cast themselves in the role of suffering victim and their opponents in the role of perpetrators. The trauma drama of the Holocaust, the aesthetic whom moral resources that get provided for denunciation of ethnic, racial, and ideological oppression, powered, or at least helped to power, a series of other transformations in the second half of the 20th century. For example, the struggle against Western imperialism came to be experienced through this prison. Imperialism had once been viewed by Westerners as a civilizing gift. But in the shadow of the Holocaust and its corrosive critiques of modernity's uh, pretensions, Western people began to reconceive imperialism as genocide, as objectification and other, as the cultural and physical destruction of stigmatized civilizations and peoples who were non-white, non-Christian, non-Western, Africans, Algerians, Vietnamese, Indians, Chinese, 
these civilizations were constructed by critics of imperialism in the West as helpless victims, French and British armies and administrators constructed as heinous perpetrators of mass murder or genocide. In the post-Holocaust era, influential Western audiences came to understand imperialism, in other words, according to the logic of the overarching common drama that I described. Seeing colonial governments as perpetrators of genocide and those colonized as abject victims, citizens not only extended sympathy and material support to anti-imperialist movements, whether violent or not, but struggled to purge their own governments of moral pollution and to stop colonial wars. And colonialism was ended in the 1950s and 60s, at least colonialism in this traditional sense. Other extraordinarily significant social transformations also unfolded uh, inside this post-Holocaust frame. Consider, for example, the African American civil rights movement. Black leaders, I would argue, saw how in the wake of the Holocaust, attacks on anti-Semitic feelings and institutions were beginning to strike chords of sympathy and identification among Americans, white Christian or groups. African Americans projected themselves into the generalized role of earlier Jewish victims, engaging in dramatic performances that generated traumatic violence against innocent and peaceful demonstrators, the civil rights movement depicted white Southern officials as Gestapo-like, out of control, Native American Nazis motivated by radical racial hatred. The contemporaneous recovery of slave narratives about the middle passage of captured victims from Africa to the New World, this discovery just began in the late 1960s, functioned as an analogy with the cattle cars that transported Jews to death camps in the early 1940s, reinforcing the equation of America's racial caste system with Nazi genocide. Northern white Americans increasingly identified with the black stigmatized victims of Jim Crow racism withdrawing from white Southern perpetrators a century of sentimental support. What flowed from this racial trauma drama were radical legal and institutional repairs in the social structure of the United States. A similar story about analogical employment and institutional change can be told for the struggles of indigenous peoples in settler societies West. Whether identified as Indians, Native Americans, Aborigines, or First Peoples, in the post-Holocaust world, the populations who faced European and later American and Australian expansion were characterized as victims, their opponents as perpetrators, and the crime as genocide. Only in the decades after World War II did the victims of this slow-moving mass destruction of Native peoples become humanized in a manner that could elicit cultural identification and empathy. Their styles of dress, their pierced and tattooed bodies, their painting, sculptures, music, and dance have recently entered into the core of the contemporary modern imagination. That's why we have tattoos. It's a form of identification with these first peoples. It's part of a, a trauma process, a cultural process. And as a result, the struggles for compensation have generated often significant political support and social transformation legally and in other ways have sometimes been made. This qualifier of sometimes provides a segue to the dark other side of the trauma process, which I want to speak about in 
last few minutes of this lecture. Because as we know all too well, social groups often refuse to recognize the suffering of others. And even when they do, they frequently place the causal responsibility for inflicting that suffering on events and actors other than themselves. What follows from such refusals is a failure to identify and a failure to amplify. Often having the process of trauma creation prevents the possibility of achieving a moral stance. It restricts solidarity, leaving others to suffer alone. Laws are not changed and institutions are not prepared. And the strengths that trigger the initial trauma are left in place and may reoccur. Let's look again at the post-war trauma process at centers, for example, in First Peoples. Settler societies justify and often ennoble their dominating expansion as a form of evolutionary progress, evoking civilized stories about religious salvation and the cultivation of virgin lands. But four decades ago, chastened by the increasingly powerful legend, of the Holocaust, as I said, Western world groups began to displace this racialized strand of their foundational narratives and began to weave new origin myths in movies, television, songs, novels, and paintings that acknowledge the suffering of, of the native peoples. Australian leaders, for example, apologized and offered reparations, reparations to the radically marginalized uh, aboriginals and the nation's intellectuals and uh, cultural entrepreneurs transfigured aboriginal drawings, totemic drawings, into highly valuable forms of art. I want to talk about this, but the Western ended as a cultural, popular cultural form in the United States. 60s and 70s as part of the same reconstruction of trauma process. The Western had been probably the most influential and popular culture form for a hundred years, but it was over. Because there was a new identification with indigenous peoples, and cowboy and Indian movies were all about killing the Indians in the early evening. That's the it was occasion. But in recent efforts, these broad efforts of cultural revision have attenuated and institutionally has have slowed down. For example, when a conservative Australian Prime Minister named John Howard came to power 20 years ago, he very publicly retracted the Labour government's apology and advised abolitionists to simply get on. It's impossible to imagine that a Christian prime minister in the West would display such ambivalence about the Holocaust, much less contemporary Germans. Indeed, most of Europe denying the Holocaust is a crime. I think the same ambivalence and polarization has marred Western efforts and we'll see non western efforts to deal with their imperial histories. For example, when British Prime Minister David Cameron visited India, visited India two years ago, he spoke about the tremendous opportunities that India offered for British business, but he never mentioned the fact that Britain had uh, destroyed, for example, the Indian continent in fire uh, in previous centuries. And his culture secretary ordered that the British school books be revised to emphasize the benefits of imperialism uh, in the 19th and early 20th century. Um, the Soviet Union lost its empire just a generation ago. But the leaders and masses of the Russian remnant 
people are still living in Russia, um, mostly feel deprived, not guilty, about their imperialism. Their sympathy and solidarity is reserved not to the local cultures and people they dominated and sought to destroy, but for the ethnic Russians who have been left behind as minorities in the country, but in the countries of the Baltics and Eastern Europe, who they dominate. I would call this a very restrictive kind of trauma process where you feel sorry for yourself as a perpetrator who is frustrated rather than the victims of what you did. And the effects of it are being played out before our very eyes as Russia reoccupies some of those more former territories like Crimea and threatens Ukraine. Perhaps the most consequential short circuiting of an imperial trauma process has unfolded way on the other side of the world in the Far East. In recent decades, Japanese officials have steadfastly refused to acknowledge the brutal decades long occupation of China and Korea that preceded the nation's 1945 military defeat at the hands of the United States. If the very existence of a traumatic occupation is denied, the suffering of its victims can obviously not be contemplated, let alone become the object of empathy. The status of perpetrator is rejected, and solidarity remains very restricted. There's been a tremendous controversy over the last 10 years about whether Japanese leaders will acknowledge and apologize for the up to 200,000 Korean women who were sold into sex slavery to service the Japanese soldiers who were occupying Korea and China. When the Prime Minister, the most recent Prime Minister, Shinzo Abe, came to power, he formally requested that the United Nations uh, uh, that reverse its judgment against Most revealingly, though, is the Nanjing Massacre, where Japanese soldiers hacked and shot to death over the course of just six weeks' time. Almost 200,000 Chinese began in December of 1938. Nanjing was the capital of China at that time. The Yasukuni Shrine is a veteran shrine in Tokyo, which Prime Minister Abe has resumed visiting. And it depicts the Chinese as the aggressors in Nanjing. And Japan is only reluctantly responding and makes no, no reference at all to the fact that there was a massacre. The entire elaborate construction of this, uh, of this shrine, which is like a museum, never mentions the fact that there was a Holocaust or that up to 200,000 people were murdered by the Japanese soldiers. Such a blocked trauma process allows Japan to refuse to take responsibility for its perpetrator role vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese. The Yasukuni Shrine frames Japan's wartime foreign and military policy, which they call the East Asian co-prosperity sphere, not as an imperial expansion, but as an effort to confront American hegemony. And its, its war against America, like its military action in Nanjing, is framed as a justified form of national self-defense. This restricted construction of trauma suggests that wartime Japan, not the hundreds and thousands of people it dominated and murdered, that deserves the victim role. After all, Japan cities were firebombed and Hiroshima and Nagasaki experienced the Holocaust. So the big problem in the uh, Far East, in East Asia, is that Japan 
continues to see itself as a victim, not as a perpetrator. They haven't. So trauma process I've described that Western Christian peoples and Germans most miraculously have assumed in a trauma process that's enlarged a sense of identification with others hasn't happened in the East Asia. And this has obviously giant institutional effects. It's not just a matter of emotion and meaning. Because with the cultural pathways for experiencing wider solidarity blocked, contemporary Japanese don't reach out to China or Korea. Even as China's economic fortunes are intertwined with Japan's, the Chinese are building up their naval forces against, uh, against Japan and Korea and declaring disputed islands of their own. Prime Minister Abe recently compared Chinese military activity to the German naval buildup proceeding in the First World War, and he works very hard today to reshape Japan's military profile and to end its peace constitution, in other words, prepare Japan for war. This model of abrogated trauma also applies to mass murders committed by totalitarian communist states. Mao's PRC and Stalin's USSR instigated programs that directly and indirectly decimated tens of millions of real citizens. During the great famine that followed Mao's great leap forward in the late 1950, millions of Chinese people perished in silence because the government blocked efforts at providing relief because you couldn't talk about the math of millions of people. In the decades following, the cultural revolution led to millions of more people being murdered and dying. Decades have passed, and the revolutionary Maoist regime has disappeared. But in contemporary China, it remains impossible publicly to discuss, let alone to mourn, these traumatic events. The political party that perpetrated the horrors still clings to a progressive, narrative that stars itself, and the party continues to control the means of symbolic production. How can the rule of law, let alone democracy, be institutionalized in a society whose government refuses to accept moral responsibility for the mass murders that they committed? The Russian case seems to be different on its face, because the party state has been uh, destroyed. But the effect of the trauma process has been much less. The national self-search in post yeltsin Russia, which I started this lecture off with reading a few paragraphs about, Yeltsin, uh, Putin's insistence that Russians take pride in their greatness again, makes it extraordinarily difficult to revisit the hundreds of thousands imprisoned and killed in the Gulag Archipelago by Stalin. The millions who starved during the Ukrainian famine and the number of those victims of Stalin's other massive crimes. The wartime leader Stalin continues to be configured as a leading protagonist in Russia's modernizing narrative. And even the memory records of his millions of victims are being destroyed. Memorial, the Moscow-based human rights organization dedicated simply to preserving artifacts and memories about those who perished in the Gulag, is being hounded by the Putin government, its leaders arrested along with other Russian NGOs. But as I read in the beginning of this lecture, if Stalin cannot be constructed as a perpetrator, then his dictatorship cannot be delegitimated. And of course, there is legitimation for Putin's own dictatorship as well. Now, just let me conclude. Individual victims react to traumatic injury with repression and denial, get, gaining relief when these psychological defenses are overcome, bringing pain into consciousness so that they are able to mourn. That's the idea of PTSD, 
uh, things we're very familiar with today. We started really with, with World War I and the idea of shell shock in the morning. But for collectivities, I would argue, it's not that kind of a process. You can't move from the individual to the collective or the sociological. Rather than denial and repression and working through its matter of symbolic construction and frame of creating stories and characters and moving along from there, the we is constructed via narration and coding. And it is this collective identity that experiences and confronts the new danger. Millions of individuals may be lost, may have lost their lives, and many more experience grievous pain. Even then, however, the construction of a shared cultural trauma is not guaranteed. The lives lost and hands experience are individual facts, but shared trauma depends on the collective processes of cultural interpretation that I described. Thank you. Well, the people who perpetrate mass murders will, the, 
usually denied to take place. The uh, propaganda. And uh, in a war that usually occurs in periods of intense internal civil war or international war. Um, the fascinating and horrible thing about the Armenian genocide is that the Turks managed to maintain that denial for most of the 20th century. <coughs> so that it's still, it's a little more ambiguous now, but it's still the official Turkish policy that there was no genocide. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a very, this is something that some people study in using the model of class of Now I'm going to go on. Okay. Um, do you believe that um, with all the stuff that's happening with ISIS and whatnot, do you believe that we're living in the beginnings of the trauma trauma? Well, I think that I think that the terrorism is a is a trauma for that emerged on September 11th. I think that September 11th was a gigantic trauma for the United States. Um, and how that trauma was processed culturally and socially was not determined by itself. It was kind of open to a lot of forces, for example, um, where, the was, where the perpetrators of that trauma was it Islam or was it um, Saudi Arabia? Followed the very unusual radical forms. You couldn't say either. Uh, fast forward to what just happened um, two days ago in Brussels. Who did that? Were they Islamic terrorists? Or were they radical Islamic extremists? Were they from the Middle East, or were they Belgian citizens who were uh, who are an underclass in Belgium, or are they both? I mean, there's so many different ways to identify this. Um, and one of the most uh, moving things after 9/11 was that, um, I think it was the Monde, the French newspaper said, um, "We are all." In other words, the victim was universalized. They, of course, didn't know how true that would become in terms of their own problems. So, I mean, I think that terrorism is a trauma. And it's very much a matter of contention how it's understood, because how it's understood has repercussions. The U.S. went to war uh, twice in the ways of 9 11 consequences. And those wars were framed as responses to uh, the problem which could stop that from happening again. But I did two more back there. Yes, uh, recently Congress just uh, recognized the genocide of Christians in Iraq and uh, Syria. Um, what took so long? Because if we knew that was happening for for years, that they would take, especially the Zetis, if the uh, Zeti women had been captured, tried to have uh, uh, sex slaves, bought and sold as sex slaves or children, and the Zeti men were uh, heads cut off. I guess they're trying to follow their friend in Sharia. So what took so long for Congress to recognize? I don't, I don't know that much about it, but the fact that there is a dis, you know, a period of time that could be a long time between the fact of something happening and its incorporation into a, the collective consciousness is something that is the kind of sociological process that I'm starting. So we shouldn't. I mean, what, what you need is you need groups to promote this, to present the facts of it, 
tell stories, to gain access to the media, and to create a, a drama that will be something people can act with. So I'm assuming that that process took a long time. I noticed that in the recent uh, Republican campaign president that, for example, um, the fact that there's a Holocaust happening to Christians in these countries is being presented as grounds for the U.S. to be in those countries. And in a way, how? If there is a, that's the thing, if you can identify something as a Holocaust, as a genocide, it mandates immediate human So that's why there's so much resistance uh, to identifying something as a Holocaust by some people. For example, um, the, the massacres that were going in inside the former Yugoslavia, uh, when Clinton was running for office in 1992, he said he would do something about that. He was elected, and for eight, for six years, he, read, he said, this isn't a genocide. This isn't a genocide. Because he knew that if he agreed with the word genocide, then he and Mayor would have to agree. And finally, he did. But there's been various books written saying that he sat looking at a Holocaust unfold. Which is the act, the moral accusation that is made, for example, against Obama and against various leaders who are, who other people say there's a Holocaust. Of course, a lot of European and leftist intellectuals accuse the U.S. of committing the genocide in its um, in its market quarantine of Iraq um, after. Saying that they claim a million young Iraqis have been killed, they have, have died from starvation, etc. Et there was never anything that had a dramatic appeal inside of the United States. It wasn't how we understood that uh, process. And they had there. Saying that there are 
there are, there are many background factors that affect whether this can take place or not, and whether the stories that are created will uh, have a dramatic effect. Um, but I did want to use the case of Jews as the main example, because the Jews were really despised. They weren't, it wasn't thought, oh, well, third by God for Europeans, not at all. They were marginalized for 2,000 years, subject. So it's quite fascinating, and I think instructive, to study how could they have been transformed. And my argument is that only tragedy can lead to progress. We tend to think in the West that progress is kind of one good step after another, but it's often the reverse, that usually bad things have to happen. And then they have to be constructed in a certain way. <clears throat> and then so, and then things may open up and change. Like a lot of people have to be killed in a mine accident if there's going to be a change in the border safety. Um, or football players have to die from brain disease before they might be X or Y. But of course, it might also just be a shift in attention. We have always been raped. The rape hasn't been a trauma for women that elicited the attention of the society. So partly it's not just that things happen, but they happen in the collective imagination. Other points? Isn't there a potential downside to the trauma drama narrative in that it tends to marginalize the, the healers and the reconcilers? So that if you divide society up into victims and oppressors, uh, the people in the middle might look at. To illustrate, for example, uh, Native Americans uh, who uh, became uh, ranchers and soldiers and visitors and so forth under one narrative might look like cultural bridges and reconcilers, but under the drama drama narrative might look like uh, collaborators and sellouts of uh, their people. Isn't there a tendency of uh, dividing into predators and victims uh, uh, the downside of marginalizing the people who might heal society? Well, that's, that's a really interesting point that I haven't thought of. Um, I think there, there is that downside, right? Because a binary is a vast simplification of a inevitably much more complex shades of gray process. Um, at the same time, it is a process that will and need to reconciliation and mediation. So it's not a process that um, permanently divides, but a process that tries to, that can have the effect of allowing the expansion of solidarity. But I think you're raising an interesting point. Anybody on this side of doing geographic? <laughs> So you talked briefly about 
origin story. So now, for example, with women founders, some liberal groups say that there were women who were active in the revolution in the early days. We, we put, we have Black History Month. We put Black African Americans in the early days. We talk about, we have movies about the Black regiments in the Civil War and even in the Revolutionary War or in World War II and things like that. But yes, um, I mean, it's, it's very difficult. So the United States was, and perhaps still is, but it was founded as, as the most democratic country ever. Yet, it was founded on slavery. And it, it had a the Indians suffered terribly. So how do you reconcile these things? I think through a trauma process, which has fits and starts, but can create, when it works well, a lot of identification and experience and solidarity. And somehow the US has to live with itself as both a country that was involved in genocide against the Indians and did enslave and normalize the Indians Africans, but also created a democracy. And that has to be worked out slowly over decades and decades. So you say necessarily that it's important to recognize narratives of pain to conflict or go through the trauma cycles or recognize the trauma that's happening. How would you respond to other scholars such as Utah and KW Gang who say that when we only that it formulates their identities in relation to Western notions of identity, therefore stripping all the uh, most bodies of all their agency. Functionally, how would you respond to the claim that having to recognize that pain has happened uh, sort of disrupts sort of like the ways in which we understand how the, how that pain has been inflicted? Because it seems to be that ways in which Western notions of pain happen when the relation to trauma tend to be that if something has happened, pain has been inflicted, then that pain is resolved. That doesn't seem to really like, focus on what happens in the middle and what sort of systemic things continue to cause that pain. So how would you necessarily respond to that? Well, I think you, you put a few different things together as you but um, my argument is that only when you uh, recognize victims as people like yourself, and only as you broaden, uh, as you take more responsibility, which you may not have actually had responsibility directly, that this opens up a possibility of looking into the causes. So I, I don't think that it is a, a, a distraction. Um, I think that uh, the trauma process by creating a clear sense of perpetrator and victim actually creates that agency because you move what you find in the Holocaust, which I didn't talk about, but I think that is a movement from victim to survivor. And the, the trope of the survivor is interesting. It doesn't negate the, this kind of tragedy of the Holocaust, but it does show a new possibility of survival. And the concept of the Holocaust, another way it's entered into popular consciousness is through the trope of survival, which now is everywhere in the US, from breast cancer to rape and to so many other things. Um, I also very strongly disagree with the idea that victimhood is a Western concept. In the Chinese Revolution, one of the main ways that it succeeded was by conducting what they call the speaking bitterness campaign to get the peasants of China who were fairly passive and accepted because of Confucianism and other things to step up before audiences and start wailing and crying, talking about how they've 
objectifies by its randomness. I don't see that as any different from this kind of broad process. Yeah. Um, when you were discussing a little bit that you touched this like um, pairs and stuff like that, so how does the trauma process unfold when you can't find, like when you can't put the things to the perpetrator? Does it take longer? Can you just not unfold the process at all? I think that's a big problem. I think that uh, if you can't put a face and a name in the story, then it's it can't unfold. Right? Okay. I mean, the U.S. can send money or you know people, but look at the things that are on TV all the time. You know, on TV commercials, they show a child with a blood and valley, and they show suffering. They try to personalize these big personal processes. Um, it's the same really with migration, immigration. People are uh, political figures. Want some figures, like say, want there to be a repressive attitude towards immigration policies to prevent. And there, this pop, this political position, this argument uh, has to carefully uh, stay away from the images of. Suffering. Uh, whereas if you go to Mexico and you look at how they present this immigration, it's of these courageous people whose lives are being miserable by the United States and who suffer even when they come here from poverty and discrimination. So um, it's a, it has these broad implications. And I, I think that, I think for a let's say, Hispanic are, are still largely baseless to it's not just people in the city. I don't know. Maybe not. You stated that an individual can't see someone suffering unless you see them as a human. Do you feel that suffering their feelings are reducing to see them as a human? Do you think that the whether Muslims are really human? stays out of the conversation. Uh, and there's no, even in France, there's not, uh, so there's not identification. The more I thought about why are these people trying to do this to us? And it's decontextualized in a way that doesn't go well, I would say, for the future of relations on, on either side. Yeah? Um, I kind of like to draw a comparison between American slavery and Nazism in Germany. Today, neo-Nazism is illegal in Germany, and any kind of expression favoring Nazism is illegal. They don't have uh, that under their freedom of expression. However, in America, in terms of slavery today, um, people that were, I guess, very, their families were very adamant about Jim Crow laws, they're allowed to assemble in KKK rallies and White Knight chapter rallies. Uh, do you believe punitive action should be taken against them under this assembly, even if it's a non-violent thing to do? Do you feel like we should kind of emulate how Germany handles neo-Nazism? Well, that's a very interesting question. I mean, I think that 
we have different ideas of free speech in the United States than any European country, including England. So we, we allow, because of the Bill of Rights and the legal tradition, and we allow hate speech. And that's a very different understanding of, of stuff. Nonetheless, there are, there is a continuous uh, condemnation of the things associated with slavery. For example, the controversy over the Confederate flag is, a, is very, I think, very significant sociological process. Um, and one thing about making things legal and allowing speech is that it, it allows social learning. And so I think it was surprising to me to most, or at least a lot of white people, that black people in the South could feel so strongly about this, that it wasn't just a nostalgic symbol of the sentimental controversy, but a symbol of slavery. That was, I think that helped create a sense of identification. And the whole issue of slavery as a as a trauma is a very fraught and significant one in the history of the United States. Um, there was this important mini-series called Roots that was in the 1970s. Have any of you heard of Roots? And uh, the guy who starred in this recent movie of uh, boxing, yeah. Anyway, Creed? Creed. The African American star of Creed was one of the heroes as a young man in Roots. And Roots was all about slavery. It was like the equivalent of the Holocaust movie series. And it created a very powerful uh, set of processes. And for decades, slavery was very much on the mind. But it's, it's not anymore. Just bring this on. One more question, if there is one. Uh, I just came back from Argentina to Chile uh, two weeks ago. And while I was there, it was announced that President Obama was going to arrive there, which he did last night at uh, shortly after midnight. And Argentine newspapers, radio commentators, I, I give some radio broadcasts digitally, have been talking about Henry Kissinger when he was uh, Secretary of the State, was approached by one of the Argentine military leaders, foreign minister, who led the coup that took place tomorrow. Four years ago, uh, you know, that they might have to eliminate people. And Kissinger is quoted in the Argentine press and in Argentine uh, saying, well, we have to do it really quickly. And here's a man who had his own experiences with European uh, conflict uh, giving. Thank you. 
and uh, that's very relevant. I think that this that I was careful in my definition of mass murder to include ideology, um, not just ethnicity and religion. And I think in the southern colony countries, especially Argentina and Chile, but also Uruguay, you had you had mass murder uh, conducted by uh, military juntas after they came to power uh, and overthrew democratic governments, and that those countries have undergone a similar trauma process of the kind that I'm describing. For example, when the murders of the, let's say, thousands, sometimes like tens of thousands, up to 50,000, uh, left wing young and older people were all murdered, it was, there was no, uh, there was very little empathy with them, except by people who were also members of extreme leftists or real leftists, let's say, or some social effect. Because it was thought, these countries were in very intense polarized processes. That's why these right wing leaders could gain some legitimacy. But in the decades past, in the decades since, there's been this outpouring of dramatic identification with the young people in the world and uh, with the disappeared. The fact that they were Maoists isn't mentioned which I think is, is very interesting and is vital to create the sense of identification. Um, and then there's these things called uh, truth commissions, truth and reconciliation commissions, which are a very institutionalized process that began with the end of apartheid in South Africa, which is another very interesting example of a trauma process. Now, of course, the other part of your question uh, and so, by the way, you have a lot of memorials as you have as you have a lot of television shows in the Southern Column talking about these issues. Um, you have the extension statute of limitations. You still have you have arrests and trials now of very elderly people who are involved in these processes. You have the recovery of, of something like five thousand children who were uh, children of people who were murdered. Thank you.